Se salvaje en Cuba. I'm less than 100 miles off the U.S. coast here in Havana, where entrepreneurs are starting new businesses in a country run by the Communist Party for decades. As far as I'm concerned, that contradicts everything capitalism stands for. Yet, over half a million Cubans have recently left their state jobs to go start up. So I've come here to find out how in the world they're pulling this off and what it might mean for this country. I spent my entire career starting businesses, scaling them, selling them, and sometimes seeing them fail. Being an entrepreneur is the story that I know and love best. It's exhilarating and often excruciating, yet through the years, I've never had to face the challenges that they deal with every day. To understand the complexity of being an entrepreneur here, here are just a few of the obstacles they encounter. First of all, Cuba has a list of only 201 legal occupations for entrepreneurs. It includes mattress repair and mule driver, but there is no app developer or web designer on this list at the moment. So if you start something not on the list, you risk working in this legal gray zone. Private internet is illegal. Most Cubans can't get it in their homes or businesses. The few government hotspots they have are all in public places, and it costs $1.50 an hour, which makes it out of reach for many Cubans since the average state salary is only $25 a month. There's no credit, Loans are capped at $3,000, and there are no wholesalers either. Oh, and the state controls the media, so new businesses can't advertise in traditional ways. And last but not least, there are also major U.S. sanctions. The almost 60-year-old embargo affects every aspect of Cuban society. But despite the Herculean challenges, these entrepreneurs are doing it, and they're moving forward. I spent months on the ground here talking to successful entrepreneurs, those who are being entrepreneurial just to survive, and those who only wish they could be entrepreneurial. We're going to take you on a journey right through the middle of it all to understand if these entrepreneurs have the capacity to change their lives and if this movement has the capacity to change this country in the process. Throughout this series, we'll go in depth with entrepreneurs from Cuba's most significant sectors. But first, I want to give you a little glimpse of what's happening here. We're going to talk with the founders of Clandestina to see what it's like to start Cuba's first fashion brand. So I think we are like the first independent brand or we pretend to be. You know, this is super hipster for New Yorkers, but here yeah. it's out of necessity. So this is the idea, to bring this kind of ideas about upcycling, waste zero, use different materials to reusing a different product to the state. Because here it's in the genetic of the Cubans. I've also gotten to know one of the pioneers of the private restaurant business in Cuba. He's a visionary for Cuban entrepreneurs. Cuando creamos el cocinero, pensamos en que era nuestra oportunidad de hacer algo importante en la vida. Sasha tells me he faces the most basic of challenges. No podemos tener platos, como digamos el plato como tal físico o el vaso o el tenedor, igual es para todo el restaurante, pero es parte de lo que le aporta el carisma a la gastronomía cubana. Beyond this infusion of new legal businesses, there's also an emergence of others outside the system. One of the most ingenious is called the Weekly Package. It's a workaround to get internet access since it's virtually impossible for most Cubans to get online. Es como nuestro Hulu, nuestro Netflix. So we're walking around the streets right now on Havana Vieja to try to find out where El Paquete is. El Paquete is the weekly internet. These folks, they download the internet, they put it on the hard drive, and it's distributed through the island. Uh, I think in about 48 hours, 90% of the residents of Cuba have their weekly internet on this hard drive. That's how they get it, because they can't get the internet here. So we're walking around talking to people, trying to understand um, if they get it, how they get it, what they do with it, and then where they get it, because we want to find out where it's from, because we want to go talk to those people. No one really knows how many people are distributing El Paquete, but some estimate it's the largest private enterprise in Cuba. It's all black market, technically illegal, and incredibly lucrative. Los cubanos siempre han buscado una solución. Por eso estamos aquí. Por eso hemos resistido tantos años. They only know how to be creative. They only know how to find a solution. They only know how to apply grit to situations. It makes total sense that when they apply those characteristics to startups, they're going to be rock stars. Cubans have a history of figuring things out, and this generation of entrepreneurs has had to master the workaround. See, they grew up in the middle of economic collapse. What happened was, during the 1980s, when the Soviet Union was in its glory days, it provided Cuba with 80% of its imports and exports. 
It was essentially Cuba's sugar daddy, and Russia loved having an ally only 100 miles from the U.S. But when the Soviet Union fell, Cuba's economy went into freefall too. Food was so scarce that many Cubans lost an average of 20 pounds during that time. Fidel Castro branded it the special period, and people spent the 1990s learning to survive. Estábamos cerrados al mundo y Cuba se volvió una isla de 11 millones de Robinson Crusoe. Éramos 11 millones de náufragos resolviendo, innovando, arreglando, reparando, remendando. Era creabas con lo que tenías. All that innovating in the special period was hard fought, and often that fiercest fight happened in the kitchen. Juan Carlos tells me that his mom used to fry grapefruit skins to make it like a meat, but some of his neighbors went even further. Pero son cosas que, que tuvimos que inventar para hacerlo. Muchas cosas para comer. Eh, hubo quien se comió los gatos. <laughs> hubo gente que se comió los gatos por ahí. En mi edificio no quedó un gato vivo. Se los comieron a todos. <laughs> yo no comí gato, yo no comí gato. The special period became their accelerator, cultivating innovation and honing resilience. And now, Cubans need to draw on that determination more than ever. Reality on the ground here is constantly shifting. Take, for instance, the government recently suspended licenses for new businesses. This change is having a chilling effect on those who still desire to go start up. I want to start my own business. Now the government wants to stop the business in Cuba. I don't know why. Business is business, politics is politics. You open the business and you put it be the picture of the detail in your business. If you don't agree with them, you don't have business, you don't have money. As you can see, many people try to hear what, what is the yes, thing yes, yes. about. Yes. Maybe I'm a bit trouble today, you know? Uh, uh, Tammy, you got cups. Okay. You know, it's easy to forget where you are until you have these conversations. The reality hits you that you have to be careful here because this place is no joke. And it, it is a contradiction there because we want to support these entrepreneurs because we believe that by supporting them, there can be a groundswell that can create change here over time, but it is sometimes scary to remember where you are. Despite all the challenges and uncertainties, these Cuban entrepreneurs continue to make it happen. We're determined to go with them to find out how they're doing it, even as they face obstacle after obstacle. Iniciar un negocio en el mundo siempre es nadar en un río contracorriente. En Cuba es ir en un bote sin remos contracorriente y el río turbio, pero aún así puedes llegar.